So uh, we're going to have a little bit of a lightning round now that's based on a related question. So I'm going to ask each of you, with all the qualifications of you know, general uh, conditions relative to each individual person, um, the question is from Marv, uh, who's viewing on the web, and I'm going to ask you to generally yes or generally no. Should all NMO patients be on immunosuppressants even if they have been stable for a number of years? Dean? Maybe. <laughs> 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 there were rules. Okay. He said generally okay, yes. Those are the rules, <laughs> Jeff. You get, only get one answer. Really? Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, how about a two-sentence explanation? Okay. Well, I, I think it depends on a number of years, what that number of years is. Um, m many people will have a single event and be found to be antibody positive, and we know that those individuals are at very high risk even in the next year of having another event, which is why at Mayo Clinic, we made the, the arbitrary recommendation that those individuals should go on treatment with immune suppressants to prevent new attacks. The, it's obviously true that people who have had disease activity recently should be on treatment, but if you're in remission for a prolonged period of time, then the question naturally comes up, how long is long enough? If the drugs that we have now were not toxic, it wouldn't be an issue, but there are long-term potential risks of all of these immune suppressant therapies. Um, so in, uh, basically this comes down to the same kind of discussion that I have with my MS patients who ask questions about the MS drugs, and that is um, uh, the longer the better, and if there's any recent sign of any kind of disease activity, and especially if somebody is antibody positive, I'm very reluctant to have them come off of the drug. Jeff. Generally, yes. Thank you. I'd say generally, yes, because we have no cure at this point for the disease. I'd say generally, yes. And if you decide to go off, make sure you have a very good plan in place if a new attack were to occur to get very prompt treatment of that attack. John. Um, <clears throat> Well, I'm Irish, so. <laughs> <laughs> Two sentences. Um, if you're NMO IgG positive, yes. If you're, there is monophasic NMO, which is NMO IgG negative, and in those patients, those patients don't relapse, so no. I'd say generally yes, and just to qualify the statement about monophasic, we already recognize that a third, or maybe it's probably closer, maybe 15% of clear relapsing NMO is NMO IgG negative. I would still say those are a yes, but what Sean's referring to is those rare cases that present out the gate with an immediate optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, and it all happens in a very short time, and then it seems that the disease is quiescent. We're learning more about those, but those are the exception. The majority of all NMO is relapsing, so generally yes. Thank you. Richard? Um, I would have to give the caveat that it depends on your prior treatment. So. We use stem cell transplants for DEVIX, and after the procedure, they're on no therapy at all, and we keep them on no therapy. So I think you, you it, in this unique uh, situation, the answer would be no. But ultimately, I think the answer for everybody here is to have an accurate biomarker that heralds relapse, and then you can stop and follow that way. Stay tuned for Dr. Burt's uh, discussion later. Katja? Uh, likely yes. If you've had more than one attack from everything that we've seen and we've heard from our experts, I think the answer is likely yes. And to Dr. Bird's point, we need the biomarker. I hope that within the next year, one year, two years, that we have a much better answer for you and that it will be no, because we have a biomarker and you don't need to be on anything until we think you do. I think we would just add if you had listened to or if the walls could talk and you could hear the discussions over the last 48 hours. One of the aspects that the foundation has funded research uh, and, and discovery relates to an entirely different role for B cells potentially in NMO. So we'll stay tuned for that as well. N next question, please. Uh, Thank you. Mine is actually a drug question, and I still see another neurologist for disc issues, um, but I've had unresolved neuropathy and exhaustion, been on ProVigil and Neurotin and Lyric in the past. Um, I saw him about three weeks ago, and he said, 
I've been having success with this drugs with people um, who have demyelinating diseases. Um, it was developed for um, people with, um, my mind went blank, uh, fibromyalgia. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's called Civella. He put me on it, said, give it a try. It's been working with other people. Um, like I said, I've never had any success with Lyrica, Rotten, Provigil. Um, once I reached the dose last week, I really, I feel I don't need my Provigil. I don't, I feel better. I'm not as achy. I'm not as tired. I don't have the burning in most of the thing. So I'm trying to find out the, the Sevilla, um, he said it's a selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor developed for, um, <laughs> not for depression, but for um, specifically uh, fibromyalgia. Um, so I'm trying to find out how that's different than the Lyrica and the Neurontin that didn't work with that and what the difference is. Brian? Um, yeah, uh, well, it, it, we, I was just thinking that these are a lot of drugs that uh, I use, especially for, for fibromyalgia, and I, I think uh, Savella or Cymbalta and, and related SSRI drugs are, are pretty effective for some patients who have sensory symptoms and, and other symptoms from neuromyelitis optica, we treat them symptomatically. I don't have a lot of experience with Savella, which is a very new drug, but uh, I'm pleased to hear your experience, and I think it uh, uh, probably is quite an effective treatment for some patients. Please. We are uh, extremely sensitive to any change We've been told by our uh, neurologist to be aware of anything that is uh, outside of what is normal. Um, recently, B cells down to zero um, after severe damage to the spinal column, uh, a new type of symptom, uh, a banding, which neither one of the two neurologists can, can explain. They have had experience with NMO patients, but the the question becomes, uh, are some of these effects sensory, and are some of these effects um, not to be alarmed, but simply to be aware of? You want to start? Yeah, <clears throat> this is a great question, and actually ties in with the last one. So there, there are um, two types of events, and this is broad, that you can experience in the setting of neuromyelitis optica, transverse myelitis, any of these conditions that affect the spinal cord. So one are symptoms that are occurring because of new damage being done versus symptoms that are occurring due to previous damage and scar tissue that's left in the spinal cord. The former requires evaluation and treatment. The latter, uh, less urgent, requires symptomatic treatment, but there, it's not a sign of new damage being done. How do you tell the difference? Um, so there, I, I impart my patients in, in clinic with a few of Greenberg's rules of relapse. Um, so one of them is if you're experiencing a new loss of function. So I can't feel the temperature of water, or I can't feel something touching my skin, or I can't move a certain limb, those always rise to the top. Versus I'm experiencing a new unpleasant sensation. Those, I need a phone call, we need to discuss it, we need to talk about things, but less often are they signs of new attacks. Neuropathic pain, uh, which is a broad term and includes this banding, is a phenomenon that happens when the brain, which is used to getting millions of signals per second from your entire body. So you're sitting here, you've been sitting here a long time, so one leg's a little numb and the brain's going a little numb, but you've been, you've been sitting here for a while, your brain has been flooded with signals from your feet. How much pressure are you putting on the feet? What angle is the foot? What does your sock feel like? What's the temperature of the room? When we interrupt that signal, the brain likes to make some things up and fill in the gap. Often it's burning, often it's banding, tingling, vice-like sensations on a limb or a chest, and that's the brain filling in the gap. That's what some research suggests. The drugs that get used, whether it's minasopram, which is Savella, Lyrica, Cymbalta, Amitriptyline, Elevil, all these drugs are meant to change the way the brain interprets those signals. So banding is one of the very common things we see after a spinal cord event. 
is almost always not a sign of new inflammation, and we treat it symptomatically. Uh, this is where you need a good relationship with your neurologist. We do not expect for you to be sitting at home on a Friday afternoon trying to figure out, is this a new attack or not? You have to have a way to access them and have the conversation, how should I address this? Thanks for that question. Uh, we have one from the, the internet, um, from Burton, and then we're gonna come to the left side of the room and then to the middle of the room. Uh, Burton asks, is Celsept always used in combination with steroids or can it be used alone? Well, in, the, um, in the retrospective study that we published in the archives just I think last year, uh, looking at 24 patients, um, uh, about 40% of the patients were being treated with concomitant prednisone. Um, should, they, should all patients be treated with prednisone? That's a difficult question. I think generally in our experience, um, patients are generally treated in, with a combination of, of low-dose prednisone and uh, either Celsept or azathioprine. Um, obviously, we like to use these, we, we call Celsept nasothioprine steroid sparing drugs because the objective is to use the minimum amount of steroid or even potentially get the patient off steroid. But as we learned from our Japanese colleagues during our conference, um, there are some uh, in Japan, the mainstay of treatment is low dose prednisone, and it seems to work very, very well in those patients. And there are some patients that are extremely sensitive to prednisone. And, if, and we found that uh, even if you get the patient down to around 10 milligrams a day of prednisone, if you try to go a little lower than that, uh, you can get a flare. So I think, it's, I think it's a question that I think it's kind of individualized, um, but I think generally my tendency is to use at least ASI, azathioprine or Celsit with a low dose of prednisone for at least a year uh, and be stable for a year before I'd even consider uh, dropping. So I don't know if the others agree. Okay, thank you. Uh, from the uh, far side of the room there, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jenna from uh, Toronto in Canada. Um, I know a lot of women have been told definitely no, but in my personal situation, my team of doctors have actually said, well, maybe. I wanted to get the panel's thoughts on pregnancy and NMO. Is it a possibility? And if so, how would you proceed? Claudia, do you want to start on that? The woman on the panel. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the biggest issue really relates to the medications you're on at the time because you would not want to be attempting to conceive a child when you're on one of these strong immunosuppressant drugs. So you need to balance that with the, the state of your disease and how active and acute it is at the time. Uh, I think there are definitely circumstances where we do pull the drugs down and are aware of um, the desire you know, to have children, uh, but really it's a very individualized thing and I, I can't really comment that there's a one shoe fits all situation. I don't know, Brian, you've, you want to comment further? Um, I'd also mention that there's been a, a recent uh, study from France that was just presented at our uh, uh, research meetings on MS where a lot of neuromyelitis optica research was presented and it showed during pregnancy there actually was uh, a slight decrease in the chances of having an attack of neuromyelitis optica but similar to MS there seemed to be some increase um, in the postpartum period. So uh, that's a preliminary study. Actually, there's plans to conduct um, a U.S. study. Um, and many of you may be contacted to get information about whether you've been pregnant. We'll be especially interested in those of you who had a diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica and then became pregnant. So we need more information. But currently, it seems uh, as if during pregnancy, the risk is not increased, perhaps even decreased. And I suppose if we had someone that we were really quite concerned about, we might consider early weaning and reinstitution of the disease prevention therapy afterwards. Thank you. Please. My question is with regards to long-term treatment. You mentioned um, that there are some risks long-term, and my question was specifically towards PML and leukemia, as well as other cancers. What has been your experience clinically with your patients? Um, this is a good question, but uh, Imuran, uh, we certainly know from the kidney transplant literature, um, there is an increased risk, uh, relatively modest, but of leukemias and lymphomas in particular, and probably in general uh, uh, of cancer. 
Um, there have been some studies, because this was a drug that was used quite a bit in, in Europe uh, before our current MS drugs. Um, it seems to be a relatively modest risk, but I think it is a risk. And in our um, look at patients who were on azathioprine, I believe we had three patients that yeah, I think the, it was, the right number? Yeah, I think the, one of the patients developed the lymphoma literally within um, uh, two months of starting the drug, so I don't think that was related. So we're talking about uh, two of 99 patients over a period of uh, median of six years. And probably the risk is greater. Uh, this certainly came up from the MS studies uh, conducted in Europe. Uh, if you're on the drug, drug longer than five years. So when we got that question earlier, if you're stable, should you remain on these drugs? I think this is another thing that does come into the mix. If you've been perfectly stable for five years, we worry a little less. Uh, it's not that we're not worried, but we're worried less about an attack of NMO, and we start to worry more about the risk of other long-term complications, even though I'd want to emphasize they're relatively uncommon. The vast majority, greater than 90% of patients that are on these treatment long term do not develop cancer. But, you know, we start to trade off these kind of things. Of course, that's a situation we want to be in, that everything's going well after five years. It does bring up these hard decisions, and I don't think we should hide from you that there is some risk. Like protecting you from infection, your immune system also protects you against cancer. I think to answer the second question about PML, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a unique viral infection uh, caused by uh, reactivation of latent virus uh, in the body, in the brain, that was seen with one of the multiple sclerosis drugs, uh, natalizumab. Um, I think you're talking with regard to um, neuromyelitis optica with the use of rituximab, which has been associated with that same infection. Uh, in patients who have been treated in a variety of different illnesses. Uh, first and foremost, in multiple sclerosis patients, there haven't been any reported cases uh, with the use of that drug. However, in other disorders, particularly uh, lupus and some uh, rheumatoid uh, patients, you have to keep in mind that medically these are unique disorders which outside of the treatment of rituximab, which may for many uh, several immunologic reasons have some predisposition to increasing the risk of this infection those disorders themselves have an increased risk so we're not sure whether the drug uh, prompted that or uh, whether it was independent of the use of the drug so right now obviously there's careful surveillance for this uh, infection uh, all the time in terms of the use of either rituximab or uh, natalizumab in MS patients uh, to look for that and uh, some new tests in the MS population may help us to stratify people if that becomes a true risk um, in this population to know who's at risk and not, and ongoing studies are looking at that. So next is uh, lightning round question number two. So uh, again, with all the caveats, et cetera, Brenda on the internet is addressing a question that really comes down to living with NMO. That is, a patient has NMO, NMO does not have the patient. The question is, uh, if there's an injury to a, a knee, for example, is there any risk to surgery and anesthesia that is any greater for a person who has NMO as compared to others? Dean? Michael, is this one of the one-word answers <laughs> that I have to give? Um, yeah, so surgery and NMO, um, uh, I think generally, no. Um, except to say that uh, we certainly have been, uh, seen people who have had what you might simply categorize as a stressful life event, and you could put surgery and anesthetic into that category, um, that seem to be associated in time with then shortly thereafter having a relapse. Um, I think you weigh the options of s the pros and cons of surgery, yes or no, and make a decision about whether that's that's needed and right for you. I would definitely let the surgeon and the anesthesiologist in particular know about your disease, know about uh, the drugs that you're on, and make sure that your neurologist is aware that you're having the procedure such that if something occurred later, it could be dealt with uh, expeditiously. Jeff? Uh, to that question, I would say we don't know would be the three-word answer. And uh, certainly I agree with everything that uh, um, 
We just um, you know, brought out in the last uh, comments that um, you have to weigh the risks and the benefits of the surgery and uh, go with the fact that uh, having a plan in place is the best we can do. Yeah, in general, not a concern. Agreed, not a concern. Not a concern. Same, although recognizing obviously the post-operative risk of infection and the potential need to give stress steroids for people who are on low-dose steroids, uh, that's something that the surgeons and anesthesiologists plan, and maybe Katya can comment on that. So I thought that was a great question, you know, living with NMO, and um, I think of it as that's the question not the surgery, because obviously what you want to do is get to the point where you don't live with NMO. What you want is a cure. Um, and unfortunately, the current paradigm in medicine is a lot of these diseases are just treated chronically, unendingly with medication. And so maybe it's because uh, deep down inside I'm a closet surgeon, but I, um, my goal is to get away from that paradigm and to try to get to a new paradigm of one treatment and you're done. And so that's why we've focused on stem cell transplant. I'm not saying we're there yet, but we're making real progress in that area so that it can get back. You got this disease, but you don't have it anymore. Gotcha. Thank you. Claudia, thank you. By the way, to the uh, neurologists, um, I think we don't know, and that's all I would say the same. Perioperatively and postoperatively, internal medicine endocrinology is my expertise. I do a lot of preoperative clearances and postoperative follow-up. If you are on an immunosuppressant drug, which NMO patients right now we've talked about mostly likely have to be on, and you're on steroids, you have risks for preoperative infections that can be subclinical. Your preoperative clearance from my standpoint, needs to be more rigorous. You must get a urine and bacterial culture. What we see very often in women is they have a subclinical infection, even with bacteria like E. coli, that no one picks up. Because in preoperative clearance, if you're otherwise healthy, we don't have to necessarily get the EKG, and we don't have to get the urine. Make sure you look at your blood counts, get your urine, make sure your doctors know about this. But it's actually very important to look at those pieces. And I see the urine is often forgotten to be looked at before you go into surgery. Next thing, many patients that are on steroids also develop diabetes, already have diabetes, very important, do not have surgery if your blood sugars are not in good control. It is critical. What we see is that the white blood cell count that you have, and especially if you're on immunosuppressants, they may not be working as well, and you may not have as many. That's part of the suppression, and that's part of how these drugs work. So what's critical is when the blood sugar goes over 200 in fasting levels, or even close to that, we know that whatever white blood cells you have will not be able to cause healing properly and may lend you to post-operative infections. So make sure that that is put into consideration. And then to Claudia's point, which we've been preaching over the last days, and I think it's critical as an endocrinologist, is that we mustn't forget that once an adult of a normal weight and size is on somewhere between 7.5 to about 10 milligrams per day of oral prednisone or prednisolone, or has had pulse steroids. And those are the kinds of doses, 1,000 milligram of methyl prednisolone or uh, solumedrol. And those are IV. Those are big doses. Our adrenals, which make our own cortisol or prednisone, go quiet. So for patients that have to go into surgery the day before, the day of, and up to two days after, we double whatever the steroid dose is that you're on. Now, we don't double the pulse steroids. So if you had, to, had an attack, obviously you're likely, unfortunately, and fortunately, not going into surgery. But if you take five milligrams a day of prednisone, if you take 7.5, if you take 10, you double it. You take it the day before, the day of, and two days after. And that's our way of telling your adrenals, it's okay, we know you can't make everything you have to, but during surgery, your blood pressure will be normal, your blood sugar will be normal, and you'll have better healing in the end. Gotcha, thank you. Please. Um, I was just wondering if you have a breakthrough medication that seems to help a lot of the, or 100% of the patients, that um, how would you know after, say, a year, and the drug test was over and you took them off that drug and you put them on, say, Imuran, how would you know if it actually cured it because someone, you are put on another drug so you wouldn't know if it actually cured it or not? <clears throat> so is, are the absence of flares uh, 
signaling of success? How do you know you've truly succeeded if, if you're not having flares? Am I understanding the question correctly? Right. If you're on a drug and it's, or yeah. the patient's on a drug, don't have any flares, and then they stop right. the drug and are put on another drug because the trial's over, how would they ever know if that's a cure? Yeah. So if it's a drug I prescribed, it was a cure. If it was a, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so, so you hit the nail on the head. We we don't know, and uh, the the point, and I think Jeff made the I think Jeff made the point earlier, which is the right one. That is one of the top line goals of consortium. We need a biomarker, and we've said this word multiple times, and I'm I, I, we probably should explain it. We need something that we can test for in your blood, in your urine, on an MRI, something about you that tells us biologically we have put the disease into remission versus the disease is still smoldering and we've avoided a flare. And only when we have that analyte where we can send you to the lab, get a result and say, you're good, you're in remission, you don't need to be on a therapy. We, we can take a break, we can take a holiday and follow that level once a month or twice a year, whatever it is, until we have that, we are left frankly, living uh, in fear of attacks. And so we make recommendations like, let's stay on therapy for X percent of time before considering even going off. We need the science to catch up in order for us to give you better answers on those, those questions. Claudia? Just one additional point. I mean, many clinical trials, um, you know, if it's an ongoing therapy, even after the trial per se is done, they continue to remain on the drug and collect very important long-term safety data. And that's part of the process of moving from a trial into FDA approval, et cetera. I mean, it becomes critical to know how that person, you know, how, how patients are doing from a side effect profile. It depends on the agent, but. Um, so, so I know Janice, uh, Janice is, uh, has told me I could say this, but she's in the Echolizumab study. She's, uh, how long have you been in the study now? 11 months. 11 months. So she's asking the question because in one month she's going to be coming off a drug that you've kind of, uh, 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 you, you like being on and you feel it's done something for you. So, and I think that's very difficult uh, for patients, it's, I mean, any of the patients in the study, it's difficult for them when they get to the point where now they have to stop the drug and go back onto a drug that maybe they have not been on before. I think getting at the question you're asking, though, is how do we know whether these drugs are working? And as you well know, this study that we're, we're doing with this drug is really just, it's, first of all, it's asking a question. If we block complement, can we, can we stop attacks? And we don't know the answer to that question, but one way we can try and find it out quickly, because we're trying to get quick answers, we're trying to figure out quickly, is this drug worth investigating further? Because um, as you know, it's a very expensive drug. And the way we do that is we, we try to pick, select people that are having very, very severe disease, lots of attacks in the preceding year. And the objective then is just to look on the year of treatment, it, does it look like, because this isn't randomized, this is just 14 patients, does it look like the drug is stopping the attacks? Um, and that's how we, that's how we decide, uh, is this something that we want to pursue further? Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, obviously we, we, some patients do well on drug, but some patients, even if you don't give them any drug, won't have an attack. And so it's difficult to decide on whether a drug is really indeed working or whether it's just that that person wasn't going to have an attack anywhere, anyway. John, I'm going to jump yep. in. We have five minutes to go. Rebecca? In a patient or in stable NMO patients, what is your recommendation for MRI frequency? I personally don't do routine surveillance MRIs because usually we'll have clinical symptoms um, and unlike MS where things can go on without us even knowing it, in general that doesn't occur with NMO. It's probably not absolutely true, but at this point it doesn't change what I would do uh, in general by getting routine MRIs. Things might change, but that's, that's the way I currently recommend. Thank you, Brian. From the back of the room, please. My name is uh, John Michalopoulos. I'm from the Chicago area. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk about drugs, but what I would like to know specifically is what developments are being made regarding N NMO and stem cell. Dr. Burke. Um, thank you. In case people didn't know, I planted him there. <laughs> no, but... Uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, Doc, Chicago, if, if you could right. just keep your response but brief. Actually, I will be speaking at 1 o'clock on this, so I'll defer it to then. So, you know, just stay tuned. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. We, um, we read a really interesting study about um, some patients that developed NMO after receiving bariatric surgery and also some folks that had celiac disease um, before they presented with NMO. I guess we were just, you know, based on our own situation with our daughter, having some similar digestion kind of stuff going on. We're just wondering your thoughts on how connected that stuff might possibly be. Well, there's a high frequency um, of other autoimmune diseases, which could include celiac disease, um, myasthenia gravis, thyroid disease, lupus, Sjogren's. Uh, that can occur in about a quarter of patients with neuromyelitis optica, and it's an even higher percentage that if we test for antibodies that are not associated with symptoms. So we think this is in some way part of this disease. I'd emphasize it doesn't apply to everybody. Uh, at least half, if not more, of patients with NMO. There's no other evidence of other autoimmune disease, but there is a higher frequency. So that may relate to your question. Please. I have a question. When I was newly diagnosed, I tested negative for the NMO. I tested negative three different times. So my question is, when, if I should get retested and when, if it will ever show up positive? So I think that's a, a, a good question, and um, uh, we had a lot of discussion about that over the last couple of days. So I think the first thing to recognize is that the assays that we use to detect the antibodies are constantly being improved and being changed. Um, you know, we originally started off using an assay where we look at immunofluorescence staining, and now we've moved on to more modern assays, cell binding assays, ELISA assays. So my recommendation would be um, to continue to check the antibody probably on a once every six or probably once a year basis. And uh, as we improve our assay detection, we probably will start to identify patients that we previously thought were negative and are indeed positive. So please. Um, I have just the opposite situation. My daughter tested positive immediately after her first attack, and the last um, two blood tests, she's been negative. I thought once you were positive, you would be positive. Nope. Well, um, you know, again, uh, sometimes uh, the uh, levels of the antibody will drop on immunotherapy. Uh, uh, but if it's been done in the same lab, uh, presumably it's been, you know, probably done with the same. We, our assays don't get more, less sensitive, they get more sensitive. So I suspect that this is just a situation where the antibody was positive, the, uh, your daughter went on treatment and the antibody has now gone negative, and that's, we don't know necessarily, but we think that's probably, I mean, obviously a good thing. Please. I have a 21-year-old son who was diagnosed with an MO five years ago. He has since um, had stem cell transplant two years ago, but uh, you know, just recently we found that he had a new flare. So he is uh, trying cell sept right now, and I, you know, I want him to be on the most aggressive treatment, yet safe if possible, since he's already lost a lot. He is now uh, quadriplegic and completely blind, and with this latest flare, his, he lost function on his left uh, limb completely. So I was wondering if any of you had, um, have like uh, patients with cell sept in combination with other treatments? I think we're going to be addressing the stem cell question after lunch. Um, is Sean or others? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm very, I'm very sorry to hear, hear that he's doing that badly, but uh, I think generally uh, cell sept I think is a very appropriate treatment. Um, as I said, oftentimes we use it in combination with prednisone. Generally, from the uh, literature uh, and, and, the, and a long uh, duration of Japanese experience with the use of prednisone, I think prednisone probably somewhere between 10 and 20 milligrams each day in combination with cell sept, I think it's very appropriate. We really don't know. The average dose of cell sept that's been used in the retrospective study was 1,000 milligrams twice a day. But you can now measure levels of cell sept. We have, I don't really, that hasn't been really looked at in NMO, but you could certainly do a trough level to see if, uh, if he's on, uh, you know, if, if his levels are adequate. We, we are coming very close to the close of this session. We have two other questions. Please. I have a couple yes, no questions. Is the IgG titer, does it relate to the severity of the disease? Um, so in respect to the IgG titers, um, 
uh, we have uh, no large systematic study has been done looking at that question. Some people have done small studies on small numbers of patients and tried to draw conclusions, but I think the answer to the question is we don't know. I think sometimes in an individual patient, it can be useful to test uh, the antibody titers. You can gauge the effect of the drug on the antibody titer, and sometimes it seems that antibody titers may rise before an attack. But I think, again, this is all, uh, we will I will have an answer for you, a uh, definitive answer for you next year on that. Okay. And also, is the plasma exchange age mediated? Brian? Um, do you mean do younger people or older people respond better or worse? Yeah, well, we, we have no evidence of that. We, now, there aren't large numbers of patients, but we tried to look at things that predict uh, benefit when we did a control clinical trial, and nothing came up uh, as far as gender. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, as far as age. So, uh, no, I would say I, I would use it regardless of uh, age or gender. We need to move to the last question for this session, please. Um, this is kind of specific, but we're kind of new to this in that my wife was diagnosed with MS a year ago and just recently, about six months ago, NMO. Um, we do benefit from socialized medicine. I'm in the military. Um, but in that, we move fairly regularly. And so we may not, once we can light fires to get out of our military network and down to the civilian side, um, we may or may not be, have doctors like you available to us. So are there any specific things that we should, or recommendations on your part for our situation where we may not have somebody who is familiar with NMO, some, some just triggers that we should absolutely tell them and maybe not listen or maybe seek other advice if we're hearing something kind of strange from them. This sounds like a perfect opportunity for the clinical consortium to keep in contact with you. Dean or Ben, do you have, or Katya? The, the one thing I would say, and please speak, is um, we have a system on Spectrum, uh, Doc on the map, and we can actually go online and identify doctors in the local area across the country, and we're recruiting more and more doctors and nurses who actually look after patients. But having said that, you're looking at the experts, and I think we've heard from several, um, especially through some of these big centers. Uh, these are the most caring people that you will ever meet. They have, you're going to all hate me now, they have contacts. They have a wonderful team around them. You can contact their centers, obviously not as individuals, but those emails, because this is how we found these folks. Those emails are available through their centers, and they will respond. And of course, they can't take over individual care for everybody, though they'd like to. But they know how to advise in exactly this circumstance. And one of the most powerful pieces of your question, and that goes out to everybody and those listening online, is that there are resources. And these folks have teams, and we have teams to help that with that. And I would just follow up. I mean, I really think it's a partnership. Uh, you can't expect every community doctor to be an expert on this. But on the other hand, there's a long history at these centers of partnering with community physicians. So although things are changing, <clears throat> I would have a low threshold to just bring one of these alongside you as if there's situations that arise or even just to kind of help inform the physician. I just didn't know if there was a framework or a network for, you know, doctors who weren't involved in the consortium to, to have access to some of the knowledge or the information that you have. Well, they can call. <laughs> Great, thank you. So we've come to the close of this session, but it is not the end. It is the beginning. And hopefully you understand and can see everything that Victoria and Bill are trying to do to help solve this condition. But you need to participate in that. None of us can do this alone. So thank you for being here. Thank our panelists for their participation. And now we go to lunch, and here's Jacinta. Before. Before we break for lunch, I need to indulge you for just about two minutes. Brian Weinshanker has a message for somebody who's so dear to this community. So, Brian. Uh, Gracie, I, uh, are you able to come up?
the first question that I'm going to ask you, um, because I've been asked this, and I, one thing that's really confused me is, what is your first name? Is it Gracie or Pamela? It's Pamela. It's Pamela, and that's what I thought. I was telling everybody, everyone knows you as Gracie. Um, this is the first time that we're meeting, but um, from getting the Google um, DevX support group uh, on my email every day, I've, I've got to really know you, and we've got to know each other through a series of emails that you've sent me, and um, I've, I've realized that Gracie is really an incredible person, highly intelligent, very focused questions, highly eloquent, uh, but uh, I'd especially like to acknowledge her leadership. I think it's incredible how she took over the uh, leadership of the Google support group um, when Tim unfortunately passed away, who established this group. Um, completely selfless, very courageous. I think many of you have seen her on Mystery ER, that, that famous episode. But gets out there, uh, I, I'm sure that these things are hard to do, um, to, to open up about her life and her experience, and uh, I'm sure she had to allow others to tell it, perhaps not the way she would have wanted to have it told, but she did this just to publicize NMO and did it on behalf of the entire NMO community. So an incredible person, highly intelligent, and I think her contribution probably unparalleled uh, in the NMO community. And I've, I'm really pleased to have had a chance to meet her today and to acknowledge all her efforts.